Okay, so my name is Jackie Medcalf, and I am the Executive Director of Texas Health and Environment Alliance. And I'm here to talk with y'all tonight about um, some of my experiences that, you know, have led me to where we are today as an organization and um, some of the a detailed look at some of the issues facing Greater Fifth Ward today. We also have several guest speakers that I'm extremely excited about. Um, just a couple of house, housekeeping items. I do see there are some folks on the phone line. And um, for those on the phone line, uh, everyone will be unmuted towards the end of this presentation. And then uh, we will be, uh, or and for the folks on Zoom, you will be able to uh, join, or I'm sorry, put it, your questions in the chat box um, throughout the meeting or at the end of the meeting, you will be able to engage, ask your questions or, you know, provide us any comments or insight that you would like to share. Um, we are going to do our best to keep this to one hour and be respectful of all of your time. And um, I ask that, you know, everyone is respectful of one another and the different positions and places we might all be coming from. All right, so a little bit about um, myself and how Thea got started. So um, I myself am not from the community of Greater Fifth Ward, but I do come from a community that is a cancer cluster. And uh, the map you see here on the screen is uh, the study area that Department of State Health Services um, did a cancer investigation for. And um, there's this census track right here, 2529, and that's where I lived. And um, at all the areas in red have abnormally high rates of cancer. And so this looks to me like a cancer cluster. And we'll talk a little bit more about that definition and what exactly that means a little later. Um, about 10 years ago, um, I you know, lived in that area and my health was drastically impacted by the environment as was my families and my neighbors. And I began attending uh, EPA meetings or meetings that the Environmental Protection Agency was hosting about a local Superfund site. We had, uh, we have the San Jacinto River waste pits that are literally in the river that we all recreated and lived along. And uh, this photo here in the middle towards the bottom is showing you that gray gook is actually the toxic waste material um, in the river. And um, through these experiences, I saw that the government agencies would one, not come to town very often, and two, when they did, they most often talked right over the heads of my fellow community members. And I was a uh, environmental science and geology student at the time at the University of Houston Clear Lake, and it was incredibly frustrating for me. And uh, I knew that something had to be done to help my community members understand what this process meant, what this contamination meant for our community, our river, and our health. And um, so we set out at a, uh, on a mission to start THEA, or Texas Health and Environment Alliance. And um, over the years, you know, we have fought some of the biggest companies in the world. And um, this little graphic down here, um, with the equipment in the water, do you call this a cleanup? This is a dig and haul. This is a graphic that um, actually fake groups created. And these fake groups were funded by the parties responsible for this site. So um, I have a lot of experience fighting big companies when it comes to environmental advocacy and public health advocacy, and uh, know some of the tricks that happen and uh, the importance of uh, coming together around a common goal for the greater good of our communities. Our mission is to protect public health and the environment from the harmful effects of toxic waste. And in order to fulfill our mission, um, we use three primary components and, oops, very sorry. That is um, grassroots organizing, strategic science and media exposure. And um, our efforts in Fifth Ward and the greater Fifth Ward area have largely been uh, around bringing information to the community and elevating the voices uh, within the community because there are so many um, community members that are looking 
for a, an understanding of these different processes. And there's so many wonderful leaders and entities working within the community. And um, before we get too far into the presentation, I would like uh, Reverend Caldwell to come for uh, to speak and uh, allow some moments for us to reflect on one of the wonderful, tenacious community leaders uh, from the greater Fifth Ward area. And I'm thinking Reverend Caldwell might be on the line. Um, Uh, Christine, or if someone from my team, if you could help me unmute Reverend Caldwell. Sorry, I'm having trouble on my end. All right, let's try this. I just see a chat function. I don't see a mute. Can you? Uh, hear we can hear you. Thanks, Rev. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you so much, Jackie, for the opportunity to uh, to just share and reflect on a community member, a uh, long-term community member, who uh, we recently uh, have lost or ha have lost due to COVID. We are very, very appreciative of her, her efforts, her tenacity, her determination, her commitment, and her dedication. Now, uh, Ms. Small basically uh, came to legal aid, myself, and others, because she was curious about the work that was done, had been done uh, near the Union Pacific Railroad on and near their property. Uh, as I stated, she was a lifelong neighbor, and she, I actually couldn't recall what it was like living next to the facility when it was active, when it was an actual active creosote site and owned and operated by Southern Pacific. And as I said, she was instrumental in shining the light on the issues of the creosote contamination and was also a founding member of Impact. Not only was she a founding member, but she was the original president of Impact, Impact and helped bring national attention to the council cluster documented in the area. Oh, and her voice was a common influence and she acted as an impassioned spokeswoman, not only for her family, but for and on behalf of her community and her beliefs. We will desperately and sincerely miss Ms. Small. You know, the, I'm still having a difficult time trying to uh, address that and overcome that. As you can see the pictures from a small and uh, some of the members of IMPACT, there are myself in the middle. Uh, we will continue this fight. I appreciate uh, Ms. Young taking the time to allow IMPACT as a group to come and express our sincere appreciation to you in the loss of one of our loved ones who has motivated us, inspired us, and in honor of her, you know, we will continue to fight that good fight and a good fight of faith as well. And I know that's what she would have us to do. Thank you, Reverend Caldwell. We appreciate that. Thank you. All right, folks. Um, now I would like to uh, welcome Danielle Getzinger. She is the board president of Texas Health and Environment Alliance. And um, I would like to go ahead and welcome her to give a few, uh, give a message to the community. Thank you, Jackie. Um, well, first, just reflecting on Ms. Small, um, it, it reminds me when I started um, my company a couple of years ago, it was right around the time that the impact um, 
the news of the creosote uh, and the cancer cluster um, made made the made the national news, um, and and Miss Small was was um, at, at the front of that. Uh, so I remember the picture of her in the newspaper, and um, and as a as a mother, um, you know, I, I absolutely related to that as as a um, a friend of the community. Um, I. Um, I understood I needed to get behind this and rally behind impact in the community. Um, and as uh, about a year ago, I, I joined uh, Jackie and her team as a volunteer. Uh, I wear a lot of a lot of hats in the community in, in Northeast Houston in Fifth Ward um, as a environmental scientist um, in, in environmental justice. And um, Jackie's story and the um, the experience that she had with San Jacinto waste pits, um, being able to navigate um, that the, that complex issue, not only herself um, but for the community, um, is is really incredible. Um, and the resources that she's built um, here at Thea to share and and to expand the lessons learned and the resources uh, to other communities within Houston, within Harris County, and hopefully. Um, throughout Texas um, someday, um, we, you know, I wanted to support that and support that mission. Um, so um, I hope that everybody tonight, there's a lot, I appreciate everybody being here um, because, you know, everybody is zoomed out. Um, we've all had a lot of Zoom meetings. Um, we're overwhelmed with, with the, the COVID pandemic. We're overwhelmed with, with this, um, this cancer cluster um, and, and all of the injustice uh, in our world. Um, and um, so I thank you for coming here. Um, and I hope that um, th this community will understand that, that Thea is here to support. Um, Thea is here as a resource um, and we will use our resources uh, to, to its fullest capacity um, to, to support the community. We're not going to come in and tell you um, what you should do. Um, we might give you some recommendations based on our experience, um, but I know that this, this, this uh, organization is, um, is really needed to help uh, communities navigate uh, the complexities. These are not just, just cleaning up a site it's far more complicated than that. Um, and um, there are many resources out there. And I just hope that um, the community understands that, um, that Thea can be a trusted resource um, and um, support and rally behind impact, rally behind um, the residents, rally behind um, organizations like uh, the Go Neighborhoods Initiative and Complete Communities, and especially COCO with, with Reverend Caldwell. So I will not take up any more of your time, but I appreciate you all being here. Um, and please reach out uh, to me, to Jackie, um, and to, to anybody else at Thea uh, if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you, Danielle. I appreciate it. All right, so first tonight, I want to talk about what a cancer cluster even is, and then what we know about the state's findings in the greater Fifth Ward communities. And then we'll talk about the uh, current process that the Union Pacific Creosote site is under uh, with our government agencies, and then also talk about what a Superfund site is. I have about 10 years of experience working um, with the Superfund process on a regional level with the folks um, from EPA region six in Dallas, and then all the way um, on to a national level with the folks from uh, the, the federal level of the EPA. And so um, first and foremost, what is a cancer cluster? Uh, so according to the Center for Disease Control, a cancer cluster is defined as a greater than expected number of cancer cases that occurs within a group of people in a geographic area over a period of time. So there's three very specific parameters there. So it's a greater than expected number of cancer cases within a set of people in a specific area during a specific time period. Well, here we have the study area for the greater Fifth Ward area um, for the multiple cancer investigations that Texas Department of State Health Services has conducted for um, about 21 different types of cancer. And so what you're looking at here is 
um, an overlay in blue first and foremost. And the numbers you see on the screen are the census tracts or the smaller geographic regions within this study area. And the ones that are highlighted in red have at least one type of cancer found by the state health department to be abnormally high. Now this could be uh, in adults or children. Uh, the state in their three different cancer investigations of adults has found 10 types of cancer abnormally high in adults. And they have found one type of cancer abnormally high in children. And so um, as you can see here, this meets the definition of a cancer cluster. This is a, um, a set of, of people who reside here in this geographic area during a period of time to, from 2000 to 2016 that were diagnosed at statistically significant or abnormally high rates of specific types of cancer. And looking at this, and if you're wondering, well, where on this map is, you know, is the creosote location? Um, I know that's a, a big item of concern in the community. There um, are undoubtedly other, um, you know, quality of life and environmental uh, concerns and issues within the community. Um, but tonight we're going to be talking about the creosote site. And so that is um, where you see the census track. 2111 or 2111, um, just above 2113. And so you'll see the diagonal line go across to the railway. And um, that is the buffer right there where the Union Pacific facility is, as well as their plumes of contamination. Okay, so what, ha what has the state found so far? So, um, the Texas Cancer Registry and these types of investigation work a little differently than we might expect. So in order for the state to understand what cancers are at elevated rates, they have to go into the cancer registry for a specific area and a specific period of time for a specific cancer type. So they have to go in there and retrieve specific types of cancer one by one. They cannot go into the registry and say, for this geographic area, for this period of time, I want to know all cancer diagnoses. They can't pull data like that. It would be wonderful if they could, but they only go type by type. So these are the types they have pulled. What else is out there that they haven't looked at? We don't know. There could be more. So what they have looked at and found in abnormally high rates is in adults is acute myeloid leukemia, esophageal cancer, um, bile duct cancer, or I'm sorry, not bile duct cancer, sorry, larynx, liver, lung, and bronchus. And then most recently, they found abnormally high rates of acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children. Now, what is so startling about the findings of this type of cancer in children is that it is nearly uh, five times the rate of childhood cancer that they would expect to see in anywhere in the state of Texas. So um, they would expect to see, you know, the, the statistical breakdown is 1.3 and they found um, six cases. And so um, that's significant compared to what a child living elsewhere in the state of Texas would be expected to have. So as I explained, they have only retrieved specific types of cancer from the database. Now for children, they, the state has only pulled two types of childhood cancer. We have been advocating to the state for about a year now for them to pull more types of, of cancer types for children specifically. Our children are, you know, among the greatest indicators because they are uh, lower to the ground. If there's vapors coming up from the ground, they're lower to where those vapors are coming up. 
they respirate at a higher rate than adults and they have a lower body burden than adults right there's there's less there's less space there's less room there's less um cells and organs and things to bear the burden of these toxic chemicals and so they're um important to look at and see if there is something common going on within a community when it comes to our environment uh, or things that we might share and so um this information is very startling, um, what they found in adults and in children. However, I think it is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and, and that's why I put the graphic of the iceberg here. You can see there's, there's that little bit that's above the surface. And to me, that's those two types of cancer they've pulled for children. There could be other types of cancer out there in elevated rates, but we just don't know about it because they're not pulling that. And that's what, to me, the underwater part of the iceberg represents. And so we'll certainly be continuing to advocate for the state to look at more types of cancer and specifically the types of cancer that in our research, we have seen creosote exposure to cause. Okay, so one of the ways that we advocate to the state is by asking members of the communities to fill out our health survey. Um, one of our team members is going to drop the link in uh, the comments. However, um, we have this on our website. You can go to txhea.org and click programs, uh, health survey. And it is so important um, that members of communities facing environmental contamination and public health crises fill out these surveys because it gives us an understanding of what types of cancer are really out there. So then we can tell the state health department what types of cancer we believe based on what we are seeing in real time in the community, what we believe the state needs to be pulling from the database. And so the more information we have, the stronger the understanding of what's really going on with the public's health we will have. Um, these are confidential surveys. The only item we share with at the state or, or any entity would be the types of cancer we are seeing. Um, as you can see in the photo here, you can take the survey from uh, your, your mobile device, a tablet or a laptop. And um, please always feel free as well to contact me or my team. Um, if you want to talk about any of these items, um, we are happy to be there to support you and talk with you about this. Um, even if it's, you know, letting us know that there are people who have moved away from the community who, or even if you've moved away, um, and specific types of cancer or disease that you or the your friends or loved ones who've moved away are struggling with. That way we can make sure that they're accounted for in these studies as well. All right, so talking now about the creosote contamination. So um, the Union Pacific property um, has been an industrial uh, rail yard for many, many years. It was first purchased uh, for the railway in the late 1800s. And so um, rail yard activities have gone on here for quite some time, um, but there um, was a long stretch in the early to, to uh, mid 1900s where there were creosote ponds and um, they were used to dip poles and rail ties in creosote. And uh, over time, the creosote may and other chemicals made its way into the groundwater system and basically just into uh, the land and the water that sits under the ground and it's migrated. And so what we're seeing here on this map um, is you're seeing the railway and then the blue blurbs represent the underground plumes. And so basically that those are masses underground of these various fluids and liquids and, and um, contaminant particles. And um, as you can see, 
you know, the, the, these plumes are not just under the Union Pacific property. They um, have, have migrated out into the community and are under um, around 100 homes. And so um, over the years, there has been testing and a process that uh, Union Pacific has been going through uh, with our government agencies. And so um, looking at what the issues are now, these processes have been in no way complete. There have been holes, there have been things that have been overlooked. And um, there are cleanup conversations that have been taking place between Union Pacific and our state environmental entity, uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TCEQ. Um, but our local government has stepped up to the plate. Our local government has done a really stellar job at going through historical information, figuring out what's here, what is still still needed to take place to address if there are routes of exposure um, today going on. You know, if, if in fact today people are being exposed to contaminants that could be coming up as uh, vapors from the plume of contamination. And um, so there, there are many different working parts to this. And um, Harris County Pollution Control, Harris County Attorney's Office, Harris County uh, Commissioners, as well as the city of Houston um, are all actively involved in addressing the issues at the Union Pacific facility and the issues um, that the community members feel are important. And so um, they did have an agenda item last, uh, commission, last week at Commissioner's Court and um, there was discussion on this call about, you know, should this site be a Superfund site? And so I felt it was important to bring y'all information tonight about what process um, within the, you know, various government processes this site is currently within. And then what is Superfund? What would that look like? And compare the difference between the current process and the potential Superfund process. Okay, so currently the uh, creosote contamination from Union at the Union Pacific site is um, in the RICRA process, which is the Resource Conservation Recovery Act of 1976. Uh, so RICRA essentially gave EPA the authority to control hazardous waste from cradle to grave. This, which means from creation of that product to uh, how it is uh, managed through time and where it ultimately resides and how it's managed there. And so this allows a framework for uh, the government to oversee management of also non-hazardous solid waste. And um, the EPA give, or this RICRA gives EPA and the states the authority to enforce cleanups of improperly managed waste. And as you can see here, um, this is the process broken down from RICRA. Um, you know, it is a process it, that goes through various phases. Um, for example, starting with the top green diamond, it is um, a facility assessment, understanding what's there and um, what type of chemicals, what exactly is contaminated. Is it contaminating the air, the water, the, the soil? Um, and then it goes through um, more investigations and um, detailed processes over time, looking at what can be done to remediate or manage that waste. And so again, this is the current government process that is currently taking place for the Union Pacific creosote contamination. Now, there have been calls for this uh, facility, this site, to become a Superfund site. And so um, on the right side of your screen, you can see um, we call this the Superfund snake. Um, this is the Superfund process. So um, kind of like that other diagram, but it's just it's, it's a different layout for this specific government process. So Superfund is the casual term for CERCLA. 
which is the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act of 1980. CERCLA began as a, just like it says in the name, as a response out of a necessity, a need to address abandoned toxic waste sites in our country. And so um, CERCLA gives the uh, EPA a framework to identify hazardous waste sites, uh, potentially responsible parties, and a cleanup plan. So Superfund sites, these are abandoned toxic waste sites, sites that are discovered or rediscovered, and then they have to go through a uh, pretty extensive process to, one, be discovered and evaluated. Again, figuring out what is at this site, how hazardous is this material, how much of it is there, what's contaminated, and who might be responsible for this cleanup. What company might have owned this land or might have played a hand in this contamination or management of this over time. So then you get to the first stop sign once that's complete. And when moving to this uh, first stop sign, you then, depending on how hazardous the site is, it could then be listed on the Superfund's national priority list. That then allows you to move into a remedial investigation where they really take a deep dive into understanding the depths of contamination, the ins and outs of all of the different types of chemicals there, and then a feasibility study. What could possibly be done? Now, most Superfund sites take 20 to 30 years to get cleaned up or to even make it to a cleanup plan. And so many Superfund sites take five to 10 years just to make it around this first stop sign. Superfund is a cumbersome and arduous process. It's a long detailed process. And so um, what we're looking at here is, you know, we have RICRA, one, you know, kind of lengthy government process and another Superfund, another lengthy government process, um, both looking at essentially cleaning up toxic waste. So Superfund is my wheelhouse. You know, I lived by a Superfund site and um, I have, um, you know, now experience working with additional Superfund sites, specifically in Harris County. Um, we're also working with the Jones Road groundwater plume, which is in Northwest Harris County. And there is a neighborhood that is living above a plume of contamination from an old dry cleaner. And that too is an area of concern with vapors coming up from the ground. Um, I have um, been afforded the opportunity over uh, the last uh, four or so years to travel to Washington, D.C. every quarter of the year and um, meet with the heads of the EPA and the heads of Superfund and Emergency Response and Land Management to discuss uh, our, the Superfund sites we're working with here in Harris County and what the needs of our communities are. Also the games and tricks that, you know, we see these companies that are responsible, that we see them playing and, um, you know, making sure that we're holding the EPA accountable for this process and for them to do the right thing, right? They have pressure from the companies that are responsible, they have pressure from many different directions. And I go there to remind them, we are real people. We have real people living in these communities and here are our needs. Now this photo here, I'm sitting at a table at EPA headquarters in Washington, DC. Um, to my left is a woman uh, called Lois Gibbs. She's the mother of Superfund. She is how uh, CERCLA and Superfund came to be, uh, realizing that her family back in the 1970s lived um, on contaminated land. And um, she successfully had her entire community, over 800 households moved um, by the presidential executive order. Um, one of my team members is going to drop a link in the chat for our YouTube channel and a Zoom that we did last summer uh, for the greater Fifth Ward community about buyouts. 
So uh, Lois, uh, the mother of Superfund, she has worked with communities now for over 40 years who are struggling with these issues, whether they're Superfund or dealing with contamination issues looking to be bought out. Um, like one gentleman here at the table who uh, we also have a YouTube uh, recording here um, for you guys if you'd like to view at a later time. Charlie Powell, he lives next to mountains of coal ash and they're not a super fun site, but he's been right there beside us in, in DC advocating for his community to be moved. And all these years I've been going there and these members of uh, various communities, you know, advocating for relocation through the Superfund process, I haven't seen any of them get moved. So um, I, I, I want the community to understand Superfund does not equate relocation. There's a framework that uh, and statutes that allow for communities to advocate for relocation. Um, but there is no compensation to community members through CERCLA or through Superfund. Um, and, you know, just like any other government process, it's it's just that it's 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 just another a government process where um, you know, you can advocate for certain things, but at the end of the day, your power is people power and holding our officials accountable, no matter what process these sites are in. So looking here at big picture, um, and what's the difference, right? I'm talking RICRA and I'm talking Superfund. So RICRA at the end of the day is the management or cleanup of solid and hazardous waste at facilities that are currently being operated. Union Pacific, the railway, is currently operating. Um, so that's why that's the fit here. It's a currently operating facility. And then the second part that's the big difference between the two government processes is that the parties responsible for the waste are known, which, you know, I explained in Superfund, you have to go through that process of you know, digging through historical items and figuring out who's responsible for this, who owns this land, who did this dumping. Whereas in RICRA, you already know that. We already know that Union Pacific is operating this facility and the land. And so, um, whereas Superfund is the management or cleanup of solid and hazardous waste at abandoned or non-operating facilities, like that photo I showed you of the waste pits in the community that I came from, where there was literally just nasty gray brown gunk and pits in the river, abandoned, completely abandoned, and um, no business there, no, no operating at all. And then um, again, when it comes to responsible parties with Superfund, the parties responsible for the waste are unknown. CERCLA sets forth the process to identify and hold these responsible parties accountable for cleanups. But like I said, the power is people power and both of these processes fall short. And um, the three components I mentioned that we combine to do our work, we have found to be incredibly effective at creating change. And that's um, grassroots organizing on boots on the ground, um, informing and educating the community, organizing the people, um, using media to hold the polluters and our government accountable, and then uh, strategic science to help fill in the gaps where the agencies are not. So where does this leave the community, your community? There's a need for more investigations. More information needs to be known. Um, more health, more cancer types need to be looked at. In my opinion, I feel, as I mentioned, that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we, need a, we need to understand the regulatory framework, the deficiencies in the process, and where you as community members should apply the pressure. Um, uniting around common goals, the community is stronger together. We don't have to agree on everything. We don't even have to agree on most things. Um, and we don't have to be a part of the same, you know, groups or schools or what have you. But um, knowing what the community wants, what you want for your community and uniting around that and, and having that message um, is important. 
um, and a consistent strategic movement towards change, um, which really comes from that, you know, figuring out where to put the pressure and keeping it on. Um, I know that many of you on this call uh, who I've, I've worked with over time, y'all are not giving up. Y'all are not giving up. So I, I know that you guys have the stellar leadership to do this. Um, and you need to get the process working for you. If that's the community decides, hey, we are okay with this staying in the RICRA process. And we would just wanna figure out where we need to apply the pressure in that process. Put that pressure on and get the process working for you. If that's super fun, then that's super fun. Um, that's not a decision for me to make. All right. So now talking about, um, you know, common goals in the community, I want to go ahead and um, welcome our, our next guest speaker. And that's uh, Anisha uh, with Go Neighborhoods to talk with you guys about their quality of life survey. Thank you, Jackie. And good evening, everyone. My name is Anisha Williams, and I am the Go Neighborhoods Coordinator for the Fifth Ward Community Redevelopment Corporation. And so we are currently in the process of creating our QLA, which means a quality life agreement. And it's basically a comprehensive and collaborative plan to focus on issues to increase the quality of life for the Fifth Ward community. So the issues that we're focusing on are um, evolved, involved around education, environmental health, real estate development, et cetera. And so with this survey, we really want the community's input. We want your input and we want to see what issues do you think that we need to focus on as a community and we need to improve. So I will be including the link to the survey in the chat. And we're asking that all um, community members, residents, business owners, whoever you are, if you're some way um, connected to the Fifth Ward community, definitely take advantage and please complete the survey by February 7th. And anyone who completes the survey, you will automatically be entered to win some I love Fifth Ward um, swag items, so t-shirts and everything. So definitely take advantage and complete the survey as soon as possible. We really want your input and it's super important for us to have your input and to really know how do you want to improve the community. And feel free, if you have any questions, feel free to, I will also include my email address in the chat as well. So feel free to um, email me and ask any questions that you have or any concerns. I am all open. <laughs> okay, can I just come in and um, just reinforce uh, what Anisha just said? I told you, I, I wear a lot of different hats in the community um, and I have been serving on the Go Neighborhoods Committee um, for a couple of years now. Um, and I appreciate Anisha bringing up this survey. Um, this is more than just a survey, um, you know, as it relates back to the cancer cluster. Uh, the cancer cluster is not just about the creosote issue. Uh, we have a lot of environmental injustice in Fifth Ward. Um, and it, it might, you, maybe not see the link between the cancer cluster in housing or the cancer cluster in a health clinic or the cancer cluster in, in, a, in the food desert. Um, these are all interconnected. Um, the impact of what the, the creosote and, and the, the rail yard have done to the community, uh, it goes deep, it's compounding, um, and it is more than just um, uh, the, the, the houses over top of that neighborhood. Uh, this is about health disparities uh, throughout the community. Um, and the, the QLA process, the quality of life agreement, and this Go Neighborhoods initiative, um, I know that this community is over surveyed and over planned. And, um, and I think that you might be losing uh, hope um, that um, as, as people like me come into the community and say, we have ideas, we have plans. Um, this initiative is for the community by the community. Um, and in order for it to be by the community, we really, we really need uh, to hear from the community. Um, and um, and if, if the survey isn't working for, for you, call Anisha, um, you have my contact information. Uh, we just wanna hear from you um, and, and advocate for you um, the best that we can. So thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you both so much. And this brings me to my last slide, and that's making the community whole, right? So, um, you know, whether it's RICRA or whether it's Superfund, that alone won't make the community whole, right? Um, we can never truly repair the pain, the suffering, the disease, um, the things that go on in communities um, that are cancer clusters um, and that have experienced the many different complexities and items that Greater Fifth Ward has. And um, looking at, you know, the, the survey that these ladies just talked about and, and figuring out, you know, um, what do you want to get behind? You know, what do you have experience with? What, when it comes to quality of life, what, when it comes to making a community whole matters to you? Is it coverings at the bus stops? Is it, you know, access to more fresh food and um, adequate health care, early childhood education? You know, there are so many different items that we can talk about when we're talking about making a community whole. So, um, you know, looking at more of a holistic approach um, versus, you know, a single government process um, when talking about making the community whole and figuring out, you know, what is it that the community wants and uniting behind that message and sticking to that message. You know, I come from a community where um, the powerful entities who did the dumping tried to divide us. They tried to slander, slander me, slander, you know, our groups, break us down. Um, talk about, you know, different business publicly to try, try to break us down and make us look bad. Um, it didn't work. And eventually the truth came out and we found out who these mysterious groups were and that in fact, one of the parties responsible for the dumping was paying these groups. And so it's important as you navigate these complex issues that you are united behind a common message. And um, it's because there's a lot of forces out there that, that you may encounter. I hope you don't, but you might. There's developers, there's, there's not just, you know, the creosote contamination, that's a big player, but um, there's a lot of different interests that might go against someone who's just simply looking out for the greater good of the community. And um, I am here, my team is here to be a soundboard to help you with your strategies, help you with ideas, um, you know, to listen. Um, we have experienced some of these things and been through them, and we're happy to be able to help y'all navigate them. Um, something I said in my community for many years now, and I say to all the communities that we work with, that if you don't fight for your community, who will? So now I am going to um, go ahead and open up uh, the lines. I see we have some questions here that have been dropped throughout the presentation, so we will address those. Um, our next town hall meeting is March 6th at 6 p.m. And then our next community meeting, which would be solely specific to the Greater Fifth Ward area is April 6th. Um, now the town hall will cover um, any important updates uh, for the Greater Fifth Ward community, but we also talk about in our town hall the other the other uh, items we're working on the two super fun sites around Harris County that we're working on. And in the event that something comes up between now and then, you'll be hearing from us. We will let you guys know and keep you abreast on the cancer cluster and the ongoings. All right. Okay, so um, I am going to go ahead and invite Danielle to um, help me answer this question that's in the Q&A. Um, um, the question is, hello, I am hearing all of this, yet didn't the state say that there wasn't data to support the study needed to do a Superfund site? Oh, and I'm trying to unmute you. 
Unmute, unmute. Okay. Um, there wasn't data to support the need that this is a super fun study. I don't know if I'm aware of that study. Um, and I don't know if I saw Rodrigo on here to call him out, um, but we can certainly get back to, to you. I don't want to misspeak. Um, we can certainly get back on that, that topic. Okay, and, and on that note, um, this meeting is being recorded and within 48 hours, it will be posted to our YouTube channel, Texas Health and Environment Alliance YouTube, um, all of our social media, as well as a blog on our website, txhea.org. And um, on that blog and below that YouTube, we can answer any of these outstanding items um, as we find answers available. Um, awesome. So great question. So a question here, why were only the years 2000 to 2018 chosen for the study? Great question. So the Texas Cancer Registry has incredibly limited amounts of data. And um, in fact, this is not the entire window. So um, one of the items that we have been advocating for is for the state to actually look at the earliest available data, which is 1995. And um, they were able to do that for the community I come from. They looked at data from uh, two, uh, 1995 until the, early, the latest data we had at that time. The database typically lags several years behind. Another reason why getting real-time survey information from the community members is so important. Um, I know when we did our study, you know, the, the data ended, I think it was in 2011, and my dad was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer in 2012. So he wasn't, his cancer diagnosis wasn't a part of that study and the information we received, because it was one year after that data ended. And so um, basically, they have looked at um, the biggest window of what's available, but we are still advocating that they go back from 2000 to 1995. Jackie, did you see Rodrigo's? I did not. Yes, um, we can definitely share the PowerPoint with you. And Jackie, to follow up on on, on the the super fund uh, from Rodrigo, that there was not um, there was there has not been a study uh, done to determine whether or not the site can become a super fund or circular site. Um, the, I don't know who asked the question, but they may have been um, thinking about um, the uh, DSHS, the Department of uh, State Social Health Health Services. Services. Um, and it, they, they did a, a feasibility study just to, to determine whether or not um, additional epidemiological study or additional cancer cluster analysis could be done and found it to be infeasible. I don't know the details behind that, um, but uh, that could be the one that, that they were referring to. Okay, great. Thank you both. And so um, one of the other questions here, has the state ever explained why they targeted only those particular cancers? I have seen two explanations and um, I have seen an explanation for common uh, types of cancer associated with creosote. And then I've also seen an explanation for the types of childhood cancer um, because they are among the most common. Those uh, two types of leukemia are among the most common types of childhood cancer. And when Department of State Health Services set up a panel of experts to look at the cancer studies that had been done and discuss feasibility of potentially doing a larger additional study, um, uh, the panel, which was mostly local experts. So I've got to compliment the state on putting local community members, local leaders, local folks from universities, elected officials on this panel. And the panel recommend, and the panel recommended that the state look at um, a couple of specific types of cancer in addition to what they'd already done. And so that's um, how they wound up with some of those types of cancer to be investigated. Um, however, you know, in research I've done, you know, one type of cancer just off the top of my head that I see very commonly associated with creosote exposure is skin cancer. 
And, um, you know, there's different types of skin cancer. And so that's one of the types of cancer that we have been asking the state, you know, these ones that we see in research to be commonly associated with the types of exposures that, you know, have gone on or likely have gone on in the community. Okay, what if your home is not in the main area near the rail yard, but was included in the map and found incidences of cancer? How do you find out if your area is safe to live or should you just assume that plumes were found there, thus this is still a risk? Great question, thank you. Um, that brings up a point that um, I'll answer and Danielle, feel free uh, to, to add on anything. Um, one of the items that we saw that was particularly interesting was that the prevailing wind um, from the that that the prevailing wind of the area of the rail yard is to the north northwest, which would be to, towards Kashmir Gardens. So if we're talking chemicals that come up as vapors and into the air, um, you know, it's important to look at what wind does the direct or what direction does the wind blow most of the year. And um, so, you know, there are different ways rather than maybe living right exactly on top of the plume that folks could have been exposed over time. We're never going to be able to know exactly what happened in the past. Um, but there are also um, two Superfund sites that are just north of there. There's the North Cavalcade Superfund site and the South Cavalcade Superfund site, um, as well as many historically uh, abandoned gas stations and dry cleaners, which also are known, you know, to be polluters of the environment. So when it comes to understanding the potential impacts to the community's health at large, it's quite complex. Danielle. Yeah, no, I think that you you hit it all. Um, the, I, I keep thinking about the the um, the testimonies that people have about the air quality and the the smell of the air in in Fifth Ward and Cashmere Gardens. It's not supposed to smell, um, and and that certainly travels much further and a lot faster than a plume underneath the ground. Uh, so what we're seeing today with the plume underneath the ground, that's been there for a very long time. And, but over the course of, of history, we know that there was a, a much more acute or a, a much more um, you know, direct exposure to, to contaminants. Um, I also heard stories from, from other residents that the rail yard would give out buckets of creosote for the residents to take back and, and use as, as pest control. Um, even talking to my family up in, up in Northern New Hampshire of all places, um, they were saying, yeah, it's a great use in agriculture to, to keep horses from eating the barn, barn doors. Uh, so, you know, in, in my observation, creosote has kind of been sprinkled throughout the community for, for lack of a better term. Um, the exposure today, um, well, we know that the air quality is not great um, in Houston in general, um, and definitely in Northeast Houston with batch plants, with, with um, the, the interstates, with the rail yards. Uh, so, um, Again, there's there's a lot of different different ways of exposure. I can't tell you whether or not you have an exposure without testing um, that that soil, that groundwater. Um, but um, if you if you want, please send me the address, and, and we can do a search around the area um, to see if there's anything that that could be impacting you. Awesome, thank you, Danielle. Um, we are at our time, but we have two questions uh, left in the chat, so I want to go ahead and address those. Um, so if you I welcome you to stay on with us. Um, the first one that came through was that SEER hosted a meeting last year about cancer clusters and shared that the state wasn't going to do the research um, needed to move forward with the study. Okay, so um, yes, so what you're talking about is the cancer uh, investigation. And so when <clears throat> when a state health department finds statistically significant rates of cancer or abnormally high rates of cancer um, in a specific area in a specific time period, to stay within the federal guidelines, they have to set up a panel of experts to look at, you know, future options, a full epidemiological study or, you know, a, a further in-depth study. And, um, 
So that's the panel that I referenced just a little bit ago. And so that panel met and they discussed whether or not it was feasible to do a further more in-depth study uh, or an epidemiological study. And um, the panel concluded that based on several factors, it was not fees it would not be feasible um, to do a full epidemiological study. And one of those main factors that stood out to me that the state actually said they were going to be a part of further investigating was that there was not enough data to understand if routes of exposure were going on. So not enough, you know, sampling and analysis data to understand if um, you know, if vapors were still coming up from the ground, if, you know, people were being exposed, if there was, you know, contaminated soil on properties or parks or anywhere. And so that there needed to be more investigation to take place um, to see if those pathways for humans to come in contact with chemicals was existing. All right, and so one uh, last question here. How can the community uh, residents get low cost or free air, soil, and groundwater testing? Um, great question. I, I know how it feels to not know if the water coming out of your tap is safe or if the grass that you live on, that you mow, that your children and your animals play in is safe and it's unsettling. And um, one thing that I can tell you is that um, the communities there are on city water. So um, historically they were on groundwater wells, uh, you know, and that historically very likely could have been a, a route of exposure. But today the water that is piped into the homes in this area is coming not from underground right there. It is coming from other areas of town and it goes through a treatment facility before it is piped to the homes. Um, Danielle. Can yeah, and you on that, the health department has tested the water. I don't know if they've done it recently. The last time there was a cancer cluster, um, Dr. Lauren Hopkins um, immediately responded by testing the water um, and confirmed that the, the, the water, net drinking water standards, um, so you should be good with water. That said, we have a lot of um, old pipes in the fifth ward. Um, so if you're concerned about lead in your pipes, um, the city of Houston and actually through Lauren Hopkins program um, does have a lead abatement program. Um, and she has to follow federal regulations on that. So um, please contact her. You can send me an email, I put it in the drop uh, link right there. Um, so if, just see if you could, um, if you would uh, qualify for that. The, um, the testing of the soil, the testing of the air, um, call me, uh, give, give me a, reach out to me directly on that one. Uh, depends on the property. There are programs within the city of Houston. Um, again, another hat that I wear is um, I was working with the city of Houston uh, directly uh, with um, some of their environmental programs. So, um, if we, we have some major concerns, um, we can we could probably find a way uh, to go out there and, and sample at least the area or a site nearby. Um, and that is something that is a strategy that we, we're, we're doing. Um, there's historic data. Um, so there's a lot of information out there and we're trying to uh, consolidate that. So that's a, a long way of saying maybe, um, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, Danielle, we have a few people on the phone line. So uh, for the folks on the phone line, Danielle, will you just rattle off your number in case they want to jot that down? Sure. My phone number is, it's a little different, it's out of Rhode Island, 401-339-3997. Awesome. Thank you. All right, folks. I want to uh, thank you all for giving us your time for joining us uh, in this presentation tonight. And uh, I want to also thank Reverend Caldwell um, for your sentiment uh, this evening about Miss Small. Uh, Anisha and Danielle as well for your information, presentation and support during uh, tonight's Zoom. All right, thank you everybody. And we will see you next month. All right, good night y'all, have a blessed night. Bye, Sandra. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I can hear. Oh.
We're not <laughs> because of you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.